Welcome to Understanding Python's Global Interpreter Lock. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. This course is all about the Global Interpreter Lock, known as the GIL to its frenemies. To understand the GIL, you first need to know a little bit about concurrency, and then how Python manages memory cleanup. Once you understand those two concepts, you can see why the GIL exists, and then better understand how it affects your code. The code in this course was tested using Python 3.12. Well, most of it. To show how CPython and the GIL have changed over the years, there is also some use of Python 3.9. In fact, that's one of your takeaways from the course. The GIL is an internal mechanism in CPython, and as such, its behavior can change. The GIL is often spoken of between clenched teeth by people who want to add concurrency to their code to speed it up. But just what is it, and why is it there? Concurrency is complicated and adds the possibility of race conditions to your code and the GIL is there to protect the CPython internals from just these kinds of race conditions. This is key to having a stable interpreter and is needed for memory management to work in multi-threaded environments. The result, though, is that it restricts the kind of concurrency that you can have in Python. The GIL is actively being worked on in Python. There are multiple efforts underway, some to reduce the effect and others to get rid of it altogether. Although, that has been attempted in the past, so who knows what the future will hold. To understand the why of the GIL, first you need to understand the varieties of concurrent programming available to you and how Python deals with them. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll give you background on concurrency so that you can better understand why the GIL exists. When you run a program, your operating system is in charge of managing when it runs and what resources on your machine it can use at any given time. Your OS does this by managing a process which is a grouping of code and resources. In olden times, a program was the only kind of process. And even nowadays, programs that don't use concurrency mechanisms are still single process entities. Each process contains your code, some memory allocated to it, often split into two categories, the stack and the heap, where the stack is for memory used by the program to track what functions have been called, and the heap is general purpose memory. And then in modern operating systems, all of this is controlled by some set of permissions. These range from what resources a process can access to making sure that my code doesn't foul up your code when we're running on the same machine. The core part of this when dealing with multiple programs and processes is that the operating system is in charge of what process has control of a CPU at any given time. For multi-CPU systems, this becomes more complicated. The OS is now also controlling which processes map to which CPUs, but conceptually the idea is the same. Oddly enough, complex process management almost predates simple process management. Early computers were large machines being simultaneously used by multiple people. The simple case of one CPU and one user introduced by the advent of PCs was actually a digression. How those early machines worked was to time slice access to the processor. Program 1 might have control for a little while, and then the OS decides it's time for Program 2. It suspends Program 1 and lets Program 2 do its thing. And then later, it switches back to Program 1. This process goes on for the duration of each of those programs. This diagram is a vast oversimplification. Most operating systems have dozens of programs they're running in the background that are treated the same way, swapping them and the user's code in and out. A simple way of deciding what program to run when is called time slicing. Each program gets an equal amount of the CPU's time. This is not ideal, as program 1 might be hungry and have lots to do, while program 2 could be waiting around doing nothing during its allocated spot. There's an entire research field dedicated to this topic. How do you schedule these things optimally? Say you want to do two things at once. Given the simple model I just showed you, you could write two different programs and have them time sliced. It didn't take long before this concept was baked into operating systems and the program became a collection of one or more processes. The program starts up, then says it wants a new process. Then the operating system creates a new process with a full copy of the code and its own allocation of memory. This is kind of like automatically creating a new program for you, but having it be a copy of the old one. There's a concept in parallel programming called trivial concurrency. That's where each process can do its own thing with no information from the other processes, 
This does happen, but not often. Say you've got a large data file that you want to process, and so you split it up into pieces. Even if the pieces aren't dependent on each other, something has to be responsible for splitting the file up, and typically something also has to be responsible for aggregating the results. Most concurrency requires some communication between processes. Since a process is an independent copy of your code with its own chunk of memory, one process can't affect the other simply by changing a value in memory. Instead, operating systems provide inter-process communication tools, also known as IPC. This is so that two processes can talk to each other. You can think of these as being a chat channel that two or more processes can post and read messages from. So how does multiprocessing affect our previous time slicing picture? Well, not by much, actually. You start off with your program, which then asks the operating system to create a new process. On Unix-based systems, this is called forking your process. And from then on, the picture is the same. Just now the operating system is time slicing processes instead of programs. Processes get a complete copy of the code and their own memory space, and so can be considered to have a lot of overhead. Threads address this problem. I'll talk about those next. In the previous lesson, I started my introduction to concurrency by explaining processes. In this lesson, I'll cover their lighter weight siblings, threads. Processes are heavy. Having a complete copy of the code and their own chunk of memory means a lot of allocation and resources. And because the memory isn't shared between processes, communication requires special code, that chat room that I mentioned, which requires special coding. This heaviness caused operating system designers to come up with other ways of doing concurrency. Remember when I mentioned that time slicing isn't all that great a way to do scheduling? One reason is because most software spends a lot of its time waiting rather than using the CPU. Consider that a modern processor can execute hundreds of instructions per nanosecond, and that's just on a single CPU. Reading from main memory can take hundreds of nanoseconds, and programs read from memory all the time. That means while waiting for stuff to come back from memory, the CPU could be idle for the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of instructions. CPUs have ways of optimizing for this that aren't related to concurrency, but the picture is complicated enough without that little bit, so let's ignore it for now. You also don't tend to read just tiny little bits from memory. Transferring larger chunks, of course, takes time. Half a megabyte takes about a thousand nanoseconds to fetch. It takes about two million nanoseconds to do a seek on a disk platter, which is why solid state is so much faster. It's closer to being memory. And finally, using the network is insanely slow by comparison. A single packet pinging from the US to Europe can take 150 million nanoseconds. Take any of these three times and multiply them by hundreds of instructions per nanosecond, and you have a whole lot of waiting around. This is why simple time slicing is naive. Instead, it would be great to have a way to put a process to sleep, relinquishing the CPU until that packet came back from its summer trip to France. A better process scheduler can do this, but then you still have the overhead of a full copy of the code and extra memory. Instead, a thread is a lightweight mini process, which isn't a process at all, but operates inside of the process. Threads share memory, and in the simplest case, threads execute on the same CPU. In fact, the threads are getting sliced around inside of a process's allocated slice. You can think of a thread as a subslice of a process's time slice. This also is a simplification, as modern operating systems may allocate threads across CPUs, which is dependent on your OS, on your programming language, and other factors. Coding-wise, you now have a paradigm. Because threads are small and operate inside the same process, they're ideal for I.O.-bound concurrency. That's parallelism gained by one thread waiting for some I.O. and letting another thread execute in the meantime. Processes, on the other hand, are good for CPU-bound work. If you're doing big number crunching with little I.O., having extra threads likely won't speed you up. In fact, although threads are lighter weight, they do have some overhead, so a multi-threaded program that is doing CPU-bound work might even be slower than a process due to the cost of swapping threads. So now you've got a program, and instead of forking a new process, it spins up some threads operating inside of it. Two levels of scheduling is going on here. 
one at the process level and one for the threads inside the process. The operating system manages them both, swapping program 2 for program 1 and then back again. When program 1 is active, a subset of its slice gets used for each of its threads. But again, if the threads are dealing with I.O. bound concurrency, they might just be sitting there waiting as the packet in France is having a good time in the cafe and hasn't quite made it back yet. So far, I've only brushed the surface of the scheduling iceberg. Do you brush icebergs? Ah, mixed metaphors, the friend of lazy writers everywhere. I've already said that pure time slicing isn't ideal, and there are other ways of doing it. In the thread space, you'll come across two common scheduling terms. The first is preemptive multitasking. Time slicing is a simple version of this, where the OS is in control of when your process or thread gets swapped out for another one. By contrast, cooperative multitasking is where the program is in control of when something gets swapped out. If everyone is well behaved, this is ideal, as a thread can say, hey, I'm waiting on a croissant eating packet, you can have a turn. And just like life, not all programs are well behaved. In real systems with cooperative multitasking, there is usually a layer of preemptive sitting on top to make sure nobody bogarts the CPU. Some programming languages aren't happy with the OS being in control of thread scheduling. This is more common in languages with cross-platform runtimes. And in order to give the developer a consistent thread scheduling experience on different operating systems, a language might implement its own threading mechanism. These kinds of threads are known as green. Python has both regular and green threads. The async IO library is a green thread library, and it uses a cooperative multitasking mechanism known as coroutines. Your code signals when it's ready to give up control, typically when it's waiting on some IO from that wine sipping packet busy touring the Louvre. I know I keep bringing up the whole packet in France example, but put it in perspective for a second. At this point in the course, I've uttered a little over 2,000 words, which contain about 12,000 characters. If each character represented a CPU instruction, then a packet heading from the US to France would only be 0.0008% of the way there. This course would have to be two years and nine and a half months long for the packet to even arrive. It's astounding the order of magnitude difference between a CPU and something like network access. Okay, one more topic before you're ready to understand why the GIL exists. What happens when two threads try to do the same thing at the same time? Next up, race conditions.